Thank you all for being here and for celebrating the past, present, and future of American writing. Now, how do I even begin to explain Jennifer Armstrong? Jennifer Armstrong is flawless. <laughs> She's written eight books, including the best-selling Seinfeldia and When Women Invented Television. Her work investigates why pop culture matters deeply. She doesn't have any Fendi purses, but she does have a dwarf hamster. Her writing has appeared in BBC Culture, New York Magazine, Billboard, and many other places. One time, she met Paul Newman at a red carpet while working for Entertainment Weekly. He told her she was pretty. She currently curates and writes the Peabody Finds newsletter from the prestigious Peabody Awards in broadcasting. Her hair, she just told me, is insured for $1 million. She's hosted numerous podcasts, including AWM's Dead Writer Drama, and appeared on national television talking about everything from psychedelics to in popular culture to why Mary Tyler Moore is iconic. One time, when we were both little baby reporters at a newspaper here in Chicago, she took me out to lunch. It was awesome. <laughs> She's here with us tonight to talk about her brand new book, So Fetch, The Making of Mean Girls and Why We're Still So Obsessed With It. So before we begin and I bring her out, we'd like to remind everyone what a great movie we're gonna be talking about with these clips. Get in, loser, we're going shopping. Fall for you, Glen Coco, you go, Glen Coco. You smell like a baby prostitute. I can't help it if I've got a heavy flow and a wide set vagina. And I want my big shirt back. I can't go out. <clears throat> I'm sick. Boo, you whore. Is butter a carb? Yes. That is so fetch. Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi. There we go. That was amazing. I'm going to get a clip of that later and post it on social because that was incredible. Thank you. <laughs> That's why I texted you a few minutes ago and asked you who the most famous person you'd ever met on the red carpet was. <laughs> so I wanted to start by just telling you the story of when I first saw Mean Girls. I love that. So I was on a girls trip with some friends and they pitched it as you need to watch this movie because Tina Fey is hilarious and Lindsay Lohan was still redheaded and eating. She was fantastic. When did you first see Mean Girls? I love that description, first of all, because I even I like Tina once described it as something about she didn't quite say it that way. She said she said something about like, I just watched that movie and see a healthy, beautiful Lindsay Lohan, and it, that was a, in a dark time. So I think she's doing okay now, which is the nice thing. Um, I saw Mean Girls for the first time, probably, I don't think I went like opening day, but I think it was opening weekend. And um, I went at like a multiplex in New Jersey, cause that's where I lived then. But I also feel like it was, that's the perfect place to see Mean Girls. Um, in the suburbs, in a, in a multiplex. And I was working at Entertainment Weekly already at that time. I was, it was pretty early in my run there. And we would get excited about, the, like you would know when we were excited about things. And this is something we were really excited about. Um, and at that time, especially if everybody was running around about something, I was like, I gotta go see it. Cause I was like an assistant. Um, and we were obsessed with Tina Fey in particular at that magazine. And I was lucky enough to later go on and like interview her 1000 times um, as she kind of had her rise after Mean Girls. But um, so that was why I just thought like, I have to see this because of Tina Fey. Like for me, that's what it was. It was like, this was when people like us were probably starting to fangirl out about her, um, but she was not the like megastar that she would become. And this was when it was like, oh my God, this girl with glasses is doing the news on SNL and she's smart and she's mean sometimes and she's hilarious. And so that was the real, I, and I also thought like, oh, how interesting that she's doing a teen movie for her first movie. And I love teen stuff. So teen girl stuff in particular. So I just thought like, what an interesting combination. I have to go see this. So I did. 
And um, the one thing I remember the most about just that experience was the fact that um, it was really when, and I'm gonna spoil the movie for you now, um, it was really when Regina got hit by a bus <laughs> that I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> I see. We're doing something else This here. is a different kind of teen girl movie. I mean, I got that that was Tina Fey right there. Um, the fact that she got hit by a bus and it was real and she shows up in a neck brace in the next scene is was like, oh, holy shit, this is a whole other ball game for teen girl movies. And that's my main memory from that. Yeah. So when all those years, all these years later, why would why did you choose it as a subject for one of your books? I go through like, I mean, you know, because I write these books, a lot of them are kind of what I call biographies of shows or movies. It's the process is very like, make a list of a bunch of stuff first, right? It's like a little bit maybe quote easier than most because it's just, here's a list of stuff. And then I start to just think about like, you know, first of all, are we still talking about it 20 years later or whatever? Clearly that is the case in this one. Um, is Does it feel like it's still, you know, is, it has had a lasting impact? Um, yes. Is there, you know, like enough to talk about? <laughs> the, the big thing is, are there 300 pages to be written <laughs> is really what I'm saying. And I'm looking especially for social impact. Um, artistic impact's cool too, but I, I personally just get excited about social impact. And in this case, it allowed me to talk about a bunch of things. Like my favorite part is the back half of the book because that's when I get to talk about all of this stuff. And it was a bunch of different stuff I had been wanting to write about. So it was like tabloid culture of the 2000s and how absolutely hideous it was to young women via Lindsay Lohan in this case. Um, you know, the internet and weird stuff that happens on it. That was maybe my favorite, favorite part. The fact that this became really popular via memes, like on a delay is fascinating to me. And then the fact that there were these stories of like, you know, people who had even one line in the movie, you know, having, be, having become famous for it and have it having this massive impact on their lives. So all of the, and just like teen girls and bullying and all in the actual important message behind it. So all that stuff together, plus women in comedy and Tina Fey felt like it was a bunch of things I had wanted to be writing about, and it finally, this was the way to do that. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about each one of those things in turn, <laughs> but the the environment, tell us a little bit about the context in which the movie came out. So that 2000s culture that, as you said, was absolutely poisonous to the young actresses and singers that were, so the film comes out in the midst of what? Yeah, it's 2004. It was a wild thing to go back to 2004 um, to do it was this. Not book. a great time. It was. It's. It's both. It was simultaneously like very nostalgic, like the the music and that kind of stuff was very like, oh man, yeah, this was great. And then the other part was just so awful to kind of. And I really had to like go in and read all the Lindsay Lohan stuff in the tabloids at the time, which like hopefully no one ever did before me because it, it's truly awful. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. It's only three years after 9-11, first of all. We have cell phones, um, no, not really social media yet. Facebook is invented the same year as Mean Girls, if that helps orient you. I thought that was kind of like interesting and fascinating. Um, and then, you know, we have this growing voracious tabloid culture and also just a time when we were really, I'm not even entirely clear on why, I guess we're just always terrible to women and it really just reared its ugly head here and it, it and focused a lot on these young beautiful famous girls and everyone decided that was fine because that was the price they paid it was pettier mm -hmm. it seemed like it was pettier than it had ever been before like no we've always picked on girls but we it seemed like we were picking on them for dumber things. Yeah, we really, I really, there was maybe Paris Hilton unleashed this a little bit that like, because people really love to hate her and it really, people were so fine with just being like, she is trash. Yeah. And she kind of took it like a champ. Like she kind of like was like, I'm in on the joke, it's okay. But I think it made it kind of open season on, especially Lindsay and Brittany, these, these two girls who were much more vulnerable because they had 
trash parents and no supervision and actually fame hungry parents and they didn't have her money to right. fall back on so at first that's right so they just you know and both incredibly talented who just got like smashed down and that i mean i thought it was interesting and i hadn't even fully thought it through until i was writing this book that i was like oh it's this is mean girls in real life this is like the tabloids are mean girls that are like reginaing you know Brittany and Lindsay. And it's just very interesting how like that was blown up through this stuff. And I think it's really important. It's like people would say like, oh, these, they deserve it. You know, it's, they're famous. This is what they get. And that, I don't even think that's true, but it's also so detrimental to women who were growing up at that time. So millennials came up in this environment of seeing tabloids be like, you know, Lindsay's too fat, Britney's too fat, Lindsay's too skinny, Britney's too skinny, now they're on drugs, now they're this, now they're that. And this that is not a good environment for girls either. Like male reporters asking them about their breasts. Oh size. my God, there's I cannot tell you how many times I saw people asking these Lindsay and Britney in particular if their breasts were real. Which is and the fact that they came up with answers like she like Lindsay had this stock answer about like oh i'm i i would never i'm like afraid of needles i was like sweetie you shouldn't have to say that no <laughs> like, no i kept wanting her to pick up a mug from the table and smash the guy across the yeah face. like like i'm not just no but that yeah. she had to have this funny jokey haha -ha yeah. answer was like kind of heartbreaking to me that she had answered yeah. it so many times that she came up with this is just ugh. and like so that's the environment that this movie that is about female bullying and the way that girls bully each other came out and you know people's reactions to that were really really interesting yeah i mean the the thing that i love about it is that it um it's very 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 funny first of all i think that's actually really important yeah. um we hadn't had a this kind of like edgy funny movie for teen girls before if you and and it let its girls be all these different kinds of girls and be terrible and i think that's really important too we had not, if you think of like the closest thing before is like clueless it's a pretty cuddly movie like i mean Cher is the sweetest little kitten yeah. you've ever seen she just happens to be rich too but we love her right i mean they have problems but they're not hurting each other in irreparable right. ways. I mean, she has like a little scuffle, yeah. you know, with her friends, but like, it's not, she's not, nobody's really that terrible. Um, I know Paul Rudd lectures her a lot in that movie, but like, <laughs> she's actually doing pretty well. Um, whereas like every single one of the main girls in this does something terrible at one point or another. Um, you know, Katie is, has blood on her hands. Regina's terrible but at least she's honest about it you know i mean janice might be the worst and i love her but she might be the worst and so i think it takes it it took it showed that it took its audience seriously which is young women by being this bold and funny and giving them a movie like i mean it's funny because like the blues brothers thing even i was like i think of there's these movies like blues brothers and caddyshack and ghostbusters that guys always had to to have the little like quotable one-liners and all of that and mean girls really brought that for girls and i think that that's actually significant that this this really is showing like I'm going to be super entertaining and beautiful and funny as a movie, but it still can can be powerful, I think, and empowering. And I really think that's a huge reason why millennial girls and really a lot of millennial gay men hooked into this so strongly. Yeah, yeah. When so the movie comes out and, you know, it's a huge hit, of course, but it, then it also has this bizarre Internet afterlife. So tell us a little bit about how that came to be. It's my favorite thing. I just love weird internet things. Um, I love strange effects that we could never have foreseen. And this is certainly one of them. As I said, Facebook is invented the same year. And as if you remember, that didn't even take off until years later, because it was like invite only college kids, blah, 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 for a while. So believe it or not, we had a life before without all of this nonsense. And um, 
so what happens is as that starts to come up, Mean Girls comes out in 2004, people like it. And but then they buy the DVDs like, yeah, it's cool. They watch it. It's on constantly on ABC Family. You could almost always find it like it at some point on television. But what really starts to happen is millennials grow up and go out into the workforce and the GIF is invented. And this is super important. The GIF being invented, I actually like got into it in this, this book. This is a great part of the book because you talk about what tech, how technology influences the way that you experience something like this. And if you like, we're used to it now, but it's super weird if you think like, why, why GIFs? Like, why is that a thing? Why did we decide that's how we're going to communicate all of our feelings for a while? <laughs> Right, like it's like a tiny clip of of something from pop culture, and it's. I always say it's like a it's like an international game of charades. <laughs> it's like this is people start to like make the little clips and sh and send them to each other, and no one knows. It's, it's also important to know we didn't have Jiffy and stuff yet, so no one. You have to make your own GIFs. I know this is like back in my day, <laughs> in the olden days had, of the internet, you had to hand stitch your own GIFs, <laughs> and sh so who knows how to do this, but the young millennials who are just entering the workforce and all the big media companies are hiring them essentially to make GIFs and do their social media. Because they're like, we don't know how to do this, but we apparently we need these GIFs and things. So they go out, they love Mean Girls. They grew, This is their teen movie, they grew up on it. And it's quotable. We saw all those one-liners. So you have to have a one-liner for, for these kinds of things. It looks gorgeous. It's just, which is sort of important. It's just fun to look at. It has these super strong characters, um, and they know it and love it, and so super gifable. And they just start making Mean Girls gifs all over the place. Like the first gifs, first batch of gifs are basically like Mean Girls, SpongeBob, and Harry Potter. And they may be canon forever now, just because like they're just out there in the water at this point. Those are the ancient texts. Exactly. Um, there are, I mean, I can talk about more about this later, but there are kids now who only know it from TikTok and GIFs. I, I talked to a girl, I watched it with a girl who was quoting along with it, and then she was shocked when Regina got hit by a bus. And I was like, why are you shocked? You've been saying <laughs> the, the lines verbatim. She's like, I know them from TikTok. So, um, so they make the GIFs and they're putting them out there. And particularly BuzzFeed, because, and BuzzFeed was super powerful. We all, this is another nostalgia trip, I know, oh, yeah. but BuzzFeed was one super powerful and um, very millennial focused. And so they start seeding these Mean Girls GIFs into like news stories even. There was a story that was like, we're gonna explain the stock market with Mean Girls GIFs or whatever. <laughs> um, and it and was surprisingly effective. It, it's kind of good. and. Um, yeah, so they start doing this, and I talked to a woman at, who worked at BuzzFeed at the time, and she said, like, there's so many weird media reasons why we do this, because one of them is, we don't want to pay for photos. But the GIFs, the studios decided that the GIFs are sort of fine, even though probably technically they could have gone after GIFs. Um, but nobody, they felt like it, it's good, it puts our movie out there. And so GIFs are free. And so they, they start, and then they realize like, oh, this is way more fun than a stock photo of like the stock market. <laughs> so, so Buzzfeed just becomes like obsessed with Mean Girls GIFs in particular, and is just constantly putting them out there. And so that's, so it becomes this like ever GIFable, just ongoing thing. And so right around actually 2010, a bunch of the stars said, that's around the time they started to get recognized. They actually were, there was like a lull when they were like, oh, I don't know, it was just some guy in some movie. And like the guy who played Kevin G, the rapping mathlete, one of my favorites, said this, this started happening. You know, and people did not used to come up to him on the street and say, can you do the rap from, you know, mathlete rap? And then all of a sudden they were. The, the people who had the one line type people, like you saw the wide side vagina line, like she starts getting recognized Glenn Coco, like I can talk about the Glenn Coco story, but like the the internet actually tracks down Glenn Coco and like does this project to figure out who played him because he was uncredited. And they basically like out the actor whose back of his head played Glenn Coco. BuzzFeed did it because they're obsessed with 
Mean Girls. Like someone did a basically an investigative report to figure out that an that an actor named David Real played Glenn Coco. And here's the, an even weirder part: he basically could only be famous from that article, not from the thing, because you can't see his face. He started getting recognized from the BuzzFeed article. <laughs> it's it's an Ouroboros at that <laughs> point. So crazy. He loves it. Like he's yeah. so into this very strange thing that happened. And he's still a working actor. He's very cute. It's too bad we couldn't see his face. Um, <laughs> but and he's very, very charming. But yeah, he said people are start like started just coming like he's out and a woman was like jogging past him and was like, hello, are you Glenn Coco? Yeah, That's terrifying. It's so it's it's truly fascinating to me. And so a lot of them have had to like kind of almost reckon with a delayed kind of fame that they're not even super psyched about all the time like they're just a lot of them are still trying to be working actors and like it helps them sometimes but other times they're like uh, i'd rather not be the wide set vagina girl <laughs> she is an absolute i mean first of all what did she like she deserves everything she gets for that one line delivery like her line delivery is stellar. It's so perfect. Um, and she is the sweetest, sweetest person. But so you, um, got, you got to meet a lot of these characters. I did. So tell us about, you know, meeting them and, and <laughs> particularly the story that we were just talking about. Yeah, um, I, I did an event in Toronto about a month ago. And this was like my dream event when I was doing the book, when I was writing it. And so we got a bunch of them to come out and we just did like a, we did a North Shore reunion. Um, Glenn Coco was there. I am bragging now. I'm just, you know, name dropping. Glenn Coco was there. Um, Stephanie, who who had that line and a couple other great ones, like the punch to the face line. That's a great line. Regina George punched me in the face once. It was awesome. Um, her best friend in the movie, who's also her best friend in real life, whose name is Jan Carana, and she plays Emma Gerber, whose hair must have taken hours, if you remember that line. Um, Katie says says it at, at the Spring Fling. Um, we had the girl who made out with a hot dog. Uh huh. Um, she's crazy. That's too. still disturbing. <laughs> yeah. And we had a we had a lovely guy named Chris Anton who played. He's just credited as huge guy, and he says, um, "Nice wig, Janice. What's it made of?" And he is like this wonderful, handsome, strapping Canadian firefighter now but he had this line and he said his fr his firefighter friends like use that line on the radio all the time to make fun of him so um <laughs> that's the best afterlife that any yeah, actor can yeah. ask for um but yeah we were talking about another one of my favorites which is um claire pruce who has this i think it's an arc that kind of encompasses everything we just talked about so settle in i'm going to tell a story about claire pruce um first of all also, these are all Canadians because they shot in Toronto. So the whole high school is played by Canadians. A lot of them knew each other. So I feel like that made it feel like a high school because like they really knew each other and were really friends. Anyway, Claire plays um, the the math, the girl math lead on the other team at near the end when Katie kind of has her realization and she has to do the like sudden death <laughs> math lead standoff when they, they both say we pick the girl. Um, so, and the thing with this character, um, Carolyn Craft is like, she's supposed to be, let's say like not super put together. She's kind of got frizzy hair. She, her eyebrows are crazy. She, her lipstick is messy. It's on her teeth. And Katie kind of has this realization when she sees her of like, at first she's saying all these bitchy things in her head about her. And then she's like, then I realized, you know, even if I said all this stuff about her, I, she could still beat me at math and blah, blah, blah. So she has an epiphany. Um, well, Claire in real life looks like a lot of the other girls in the movie. Like she's a cute young girl play who's in movies. Like she looks like a classically what we would think of um, as cute. And so they kind of had to, you know, mess her up for for the part. And so she said she had the weirdest experience because she walked on set like as Carolyn and she could feel the difference in how people were treating her all of a sudden. And she did not care for this. Um, so she started having a conversation with Tina Fey on the set about it and kind of bonded with Tina. And Tina was dieting at the time because she was in a movie. And that's what happens um, with actresses. And so she said, you look like somebody who eats. Will you taste some of the, the 
craft services offerings for me and tell me what they taste like. Um, Will you translate and, this food for me? Yeah, and and, she, and I almost called her Carolyn. Um, Clara was like, I could tell she was serious. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. So she tasted a donut for her and told her all about it. Um, nice, nice dysfunctional bonding moment for, for women, right? Tina might have been working out some stuff in the movie, maybe. Um, and so that happened. And I think that's a kind of lovely story as and very female. And, you know, she does this, this role. And then just like Glenn Coco, years later, decades later, the internet wants to know who this person is. And she was credited, but they, they like tracked her down on social media and did like someone did this really creepy listicle that was like the headline was something like carolyn craft from uh from mean girls is actually crazy beautiful irl in real life and then they do this super so creepy tired. creepy creepy thing where they just pull a bunch of stuff from her current social media feed where she's she's just like a regional theater director and yoga teacher so they're like here's when her yoga class is in ottawa or wherever it is and it's just so weird and so obviously she hated this for any number of reasons but the thing she actually hated the most was the headline um because she's a super feminist and she was pissed because she was like this is exactly what the movie was trying to teach against i hate this this i will not stand for this and so she <laughs> bless her heart she because she runs a regional theater does this like performance art piece with a friend where they go on stage and have some have friends shave their heads and film it and then she writes a piece that is titled something like um if you tell me i'm beautiful i'll shave my head and that is that is carolyn craft everyone <laughs> that's so that is something that could have happened in Mean Girls. I'm I, picturing that happening at the end of the assembly. That's right. She's very Janice in real life. Yeah. Is what I, I can't use. Isn't this very Janice thing to do? Um, I just I love everything about this insane arc. Like yeah. it's like, but imagine being tracked down because you had like one line in a movie once. It is very. It's like. I mean, the coach, the guy who played Coach Carr, tried to have a dating profile, and and it was like on international news and he was like i truly like it's very funny because they truly they never expect it and it, every, all of them have these stories and they all say like i just didn't know anyone would care yeah. that and luckily like his went kind of okay like it wasn't too bad but like he was just shocked but he still had randos coming up to him and saying things like if you have sex you'll die yeah i mean which is a weird thing to say to which someone is a weird on thing the street. to say yeah it is a weird thing to say yeah. and then they often want you want the person to say it back so yeah this is the life of a canadian who was <laughs> once in mean girls and had one memorable line and this i would i do want to say it's a tribute to tina Fey's writing in a really weird way yeah. <laughs> because it's only because these lines are so good yeah that people are crave it even glenn coco right i know he didn't say that but like you go glenn coco is just an inherently wonderful line yeah and the fact that that's become such a thing when it doesn't really even mean and much yeah. it's just fun to say it's just a verbal high five <laughs> like <laughs> exactly. it's just way but i think that's yeah. why it's useful i think I, as actually that's much more useful than like i have a wide set vagina and a heavy flow in everyday <laughs> life especially in like an email to your boss <laughs> you should keep that out of it yeah. for sure yeah i mean we're talking about this and you you know you said the word useful and and i think that's such a great way to talk about the way that these there's usually a dichotomy right so there's the serious movie with the message mm -hmm. and the you know and the dark colored poster and the and the <laughs> ponderous narration and then there's the light funny bubbly movie mm -hmm. and so ha so mean girls treading that line of having a really serious message while also being freaking hilarious that was a really difficult thing to pull off. What makes you think that it, what, why do you think it worked? Tina Fey. I mean, it's a huge reason it, it has to be. I do want to shout out though, that this comes from this book called Queen Bees and Wannabes by Rosalind Wiseman, which was a parenting manual 
Um, and she she would do kind of, you remember toward the end when they have like the assembly and Tina kind of like puts together this little like teachable moment thing. That's very loosely based on the work Rosalind really does deliberately, not on the spot at random, you know, after like there's a riot. Um, <laughs> she she would go around to school she still does this she goes around to schools and gives talks and workshops about like feelings and how we can process them better rather than bullying each other and you know all of that stuff so she'll do a lot of what they do there where it's like tell me you know what do you want your classmates to know about you like that kind of thing and um so she did all this work and then gathered up everything she had learned in talking to you know thousands of y young girls and put it into this book and she's the one who came up with like the queen bee for instance you know she has her different types in in each girl group like there's a, the queen bee but there's also things like a banker who hoards um gossip and information about others and then uses it at will when she thinks she needs it so that's kind of a gretchen um there's floaters which is like they float from group to group everyone says they're a floater and very few people actually are everyone wants to believe because that's like the <laughs> kind of nice one it's like it's like i can get along with everyone and rosalind's like no um <laughs> but i was really shocked by how, how many details were actually from this book i thought it was just going to be like a boring read honestly and when i read it for this project i realized one glaring example is that um, on Wednesdays we were pink that that particular rule is not from a girl, a real girl, but these girls have elaborate rules about what they can wear and when. Um, there's hilarious quotes in this book about like <laughs> you can never wear sweats except on Friday, but only if we're having our sleepover that night and if you were not, then you could wear jeans, but only once in the week. And the, the hair up once a week is, is definitely a rule that they talked about. It's so complicated and layered. And, you know, there are week long academic conferences that don't require this amount of planning. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so there's so a lot of this stuff actually does come from that book. And so there was a good basis. On the other hand, Tina had to make it into characters and an arc. And that is and it was her first script. And she had not done that. She had been working for Saturday Night Live, which is little tiny bits. And yeah, she wasn't quite Tina Fey yet. I right. mean, she was Tina Fey, but she wasn't, your dad knows who she is. Tina exactly. Fey. And I think that her training at that and at improv was what was made her so good at doing those little one-liners. And kind of even if you look at her scenes, they're super tight and well-crafted because she's so used to doing that at SNL. If you look at something like the scene where they do Jingle Bell Rock, like there's a world in that one scene because it's then it's like Amy Poehler is the cool mom like with the video camera and doing the dance. <laughs> Um, there's the bit where just when it's starting to get a, to lull a little bit, they kick the boombox and nail that kid Jason in the face. Um, there's the mix, mixed up choreography. There's the like where then they lose the music and uh, Lindsay Lohan, future pop star, has to just chime in and start singing live. Um, and it's just this whole thing in one scene. And I think that's what Tina brings to it is being able to do that. And she did do a lot of drafts and a lot of work and kind of studied like screenwriting manuals in order to do this. Also, she is an actual genius. So it's important to remember that too. Yeah. Um, not all of us can do this. Um, and I think that that combination of things was just absolutely killer. And I, I think that that's why we're still talking about it. I think it's why it's effective. I imagine uh, the alternate version here, which is somebody came along and did the series. You could do a serious version of Queen Bees and Wannabes. You could do a documentary, a 17 part Ken <sighs> Burns. Right, music. or you could do like a bad, like drama for ABC Family, where you're just like, bullying is bad, like something bad Very happens. Very special after school special. I mean, you, you could still have a girl hit by a bus and it could be like <laughs> very serious, but here we've got that and it's hilarious and entertaining the whole way through and people have watched it truly dozens or hundreds of times in their life, which I think is a more effective way to get the message across and then right at the end they're like and then they all learned a thing and it's great the end right like then they play that song they, they there's one song that they play like four times in that movie um i've seen it a lot now but 
Yeah, they, you know, so they, they deliver the message, which was her promise to Rosalind that this would end on an actual note of like, they learned a lesson, it's important, we, we articulate the lesson, but we don't linger on it and make it into this like, you know, we're all, everybody's bad and don't bully, you know, kind of thing. It's actually pretty fun. It doesn't have to be just one thing. Exactly, exactly. And this, you know, I mean, this also gets into something we were talking about earlier, which is just like the way that, of course, that means that this movie is not taken seriously. Right. Like, this is not Oppenheimer, so this is not a real movie, you so know. it must be Barbie. Right. You right. hate that. Those are the two movies. Those are the only two movies there could ever be. Yeah. And only one kind can win Oscars, and only the other kind can be seen by women, and only women. And so, and there are always surprise hits at the box office. This was one of these where nobody saw it coming, that girls were going to want to see a movie about themselves. Just like we did it again with Sex and the City when the movies came out. And again, when Bridesmaids came out, and every again, iteration, it's just like every, yeah. we just keep doing it where we keep constantly being surprised that young women or women in general want to go see things made for them by important by women as well. I mean, there's a reason there are 14 versions of Little Women. <laughs> I'm obsessed it's, with this. Yeah. No, really. It's like we cannot stop making it. It's like when do you, every are generation we has their own. We're not due just yet. Mm -mm. Okay. No, that was about five years. Because that was Greta Gerwig. So yeah, yeah, you're right. We've got a good five years yet. A little bit of a little bit of time. A right. little bit of time. I still prefer the Winona Ryder version. Don't of fight me. <laughs> most most of us prefer whichever version was yes. squarely pitched at us. Exactly. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i'm i'm down for that one too yeah. but you know there's people yeah. who are, i mean timothy chalamet was quite charming in the last one we can agree to disagree <laughs> about that kid we do not need to open oh my the God, timothy chalamet box <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna folks we're gonna take questions in a few minutes um there is for the folks who are watching online we do ask that you step up to the microphone which is right over there by that pillar so that everybody watching online can hear your question. People who are online, type your question into the Q&A box and the voice of God in our control room, otherwise known as our operations director, Christopher, <laughs> will read those out when we get to that. But I wanna talk a little bit about the, the, report, the level of reporting and writing that goes into this because I think we disregard pop culture journalism in much the same way that we were just talking about, you know, these women's movies being disregarded. Um, so, you know, I want to emphasize just how deeply reported a lot of these pieces are and how do you decide what gets that sort of treatment and how do you find your way in as a reporter before you start writing? A lot of it is like the stuff I was talking about in terms of just, you know, even if I'm writing a shorter piece, I think there's, I'm still looking for a lot of the same elements. Um, I will, I often tend to write about women's things, not exclusively. I write a lot about comedy because I actually think like, because it, it is so, it can be so powerful and just interesting. Um, but I'm often, you know, still looking for social relevance and that kind of thing. A, a thing that I'm very focused on is, is like, I'm always like looking for, does the, has this affected real people's real lives? Um, and that can be as simple as I'm using these GIFs all the time. So it's clearly infected my brain. And like, I think we need to look at stuff. If it's in your life and in your brain that much, like we should be looking at it. We can't just dismiss it and be like, this isn't, this doesn't mean anything. It's like, no, clearly if you binge watch a show, do you know I'm talking about this thing that happens to your brain where you like think you're in the show? You see it everywhere. Because it's just like, in, it's so there. I mean, I'm, I'm rewatching Six Feet Under right now and that is a wild place to be. Ooh. That's not only am I in the 2000s, but, you know, I live in a funeral home like it's it's really but you just start to see it everywhere. And so I think it's worth examining those things. And they often can teach us things and tell, you know, I did. I actually just wrote an essay about, you know, uh, Six Feet Under and the leftovers and the importance of showing real and true depictions of death and grieving on television because we don't see it. You no, know, people hate talking about death. Um, we act like it's not going to happen. And I think if you can show this in a real way, like that's just an example that I'm using of like the stuff that I'm kind of interested in. And um, when I'm reporting, especially um, books, 
I really start looking then like it's like you have the big picture, but then I start looking for the people. And that includes like the social issues, which is sometimes the most challenging part like it's easy it's you know you go to the IMDb page you start emailing a bunch of people to see you know to talk to them about making the, the movie or the TV show. Um, but i'm always interested in fans. I love fandom that's a whole pet topic of mine um fans are a good source because it's like then you can go to them like when i wrote a book about sex in the city i talked to i have quotes in every chapter from people who were fans who really had life changes because of that show whether they became a costume designer because of it or left their marriage or started having better sex or any number of things and or embrace their singlehood you know like i have really touching stories and that's the kind of thing i'm often looking for and like with um this book i mentioned it, i was toward the end of my reporting process actually i'd done all the like people involved with it the actors the crew all of that stuff i've done a ton of those interviews um i had talked to people like the woman at buzzfeed who worked there at the time who could explain to me why they were obsessed with it and how this happened um but I found myself still like uh, people kept telling me, no, the kids are are still into this movie. Like they're watching it today. They're still it's like tw every 12th birthday party, as I'm told at your 12th birthday, if you're a girl, you have a sleepover and you watch Mean Girls. That's just the law. And so I was like, I know you keep telling me this, but like I just didn't believe it. And I didn't I don't have kids. And so I didn't really know. Like I was like, I don't know a lot of tween girls. So um my acupuncturist has they were in sixth and eighth grade now they're in seventh and ninth um when this happened and i said like can i she, we had been talking about it and she's like we are huge fans of it in this house and i was like could your girls invite some friends over and we could have like not an actual slumber party they had one i did not <laughs> and i'm not creepy and i was like i'll buy them pizza and we'll watch mean girls we could not eat the pizza in the living room though Kristen was like, we can have pizza, but we have to have it beforehand. Like, she's okay. not a cool mom. She's a regular <laughs> That's mom. right. She's a, she's an acupuncturist mom. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised she even let us have like dairy and wheat. So um, we had the dairy and the wheat, and then we went into the living room and we watched it. And um, I really want, that was something I really wanted to do because I wanted to see like, are they, are they into it? How are they into it? Why are they into it? What do they think about it? Like, they is the technology confusing for them or lack thereof i guess you know there's like a three-way calling thing in the movie um so we you know i watched it with it though so the first scene in the book is when i watched it with them so that's those are the kind i first of all just love like how fun is that that i got to do that and um i'm trying to remember any of the highlights like besides the girl who knew all the lines and had never seen the movie um the other ones had seen it and love it and like mouthed along with, they came to my event. We had an event uh, where I live in upstate New York and they all came and I was, sh I showed more clips of that and every single clip they, they were doing, they knew the choreography. We, we showed the like Santa dance, the, the jingle ball dance and- And they could do the dance. I could see them, you know how you do like seat choreography. They're going like, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, we we're really in this movie. Um, and it just was fascinating. And I was like, do you think this is what high school is going to be like? And they said, one of them said, well, my, my sister's already in high school. And she says that there's not as many hot people and they don't wear as many short skirts. <laughs> and I was like, that is startlingly accurate. Yes. And yes. people aren't making out all the time. I was like, oh, that's too bad. But um, I, I was like, I, I detect no lies. That seems roughly correct so they but they really loved it and and that's the kind of thing i'm always looking for is just trying to find the actual people affected by something and get at that like actual effect yeah. well should we open it up to questions we've got our microphone over there if someone would like to step up and start and for those of you watching online please type your questions into the q a box at the bottom of your screen Hi. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, so one thing I've thought about a lot with the cast of Mean Girls is Rachel McAdams. And I feel like she had such a different experience than the other actresses. And I assume it, she was a little bit older maybe. And it just it was not the defining movie of her career. So I'd love to like get your take on that. Yeah, um, she was 25. And the rest of the plastics were roughly real age. Um, and so that was very, you know, that's a big difference when you're that age. I mean, Lindsay's 
for comparison, 17 when they filmed this. And Rachel was 25. She even had a very different experience on set. She was Canadian. So she would just go home at night while the other girls were staying in a hotel together. And she like had a boyfriend. So pe people often said like she wasn't standoffish. She was just like doing another thing. And like she'd go out for drinks with the crew because she could, you know, like because she could, she was a legal drinker. Um, you know, so she already had this kind of this aura. And I think another very interesting thing in relation to this question is that they actually, she had originally auditioned for Katie, which is mind blowing. Um, and Lindsay wanted to play Regina. And the studio was like, Lindsay can't play Regina. She's our star. She has to play like the, the girl, like, you know, like the regular girl and the relatable girl. And so when they were trying to figure out Regina, they brought Rachel back in to read, you know, flip the parts. And the reason that Mark Waters, the director, said he was like, this is it, besides the fact that she's fabulous, period, was that he said it was the only time he ever saw someone intimidate Lindsay. And that was because probably she was older and cool. Like, can you imagine, like, Rachel McAdams walks in and you're 17 and you're just like, and he's like, believe me, like, no, like, Lindsay is like Long Island girl, like nobody gets in her way. And he's like, that is the energy I want. I needed somebody who seemed a little scary to her. And so clearly she already had something incredible happening. Um, you can see, I mean, I think this is just like an incendiary performance. It's just like beyond anything and they told her to play like like she was in glenn larry glenn ross which is another one of my favorite alec baldwin and, and go watch that movie and tell me she's not doing that she's ruthless it's crazy she might um, have been able to go toe to toe with him i him. know and i think she's doing that and i think this is why she's just like this huge force and another just like backstage thing that kind of gets back to your question is that um the notebook was already in the can when she did this movie. So there's one of these weird things where like it was going around town already. I don't know if you guys know this happens. It's like, you know, people are start, like behind the scenes are starting to see movies and being like, oh my God, you have to see it. You know, this is incredible. And so people kind of already were like, oh, this is happening. And so those both those movies came out the same year. And it was just like this explosion of Rachel McAdams doing incredible things and two very different things. And I think that was the key. It was just, it's luck, but it, and, and talent, right? That she could do such different things for such different audiences. And then everyone was like, holy shit, who is this woman? It's the range. Yeah. And, and from then on, I think that gets her, you know, the notebook immediately gets her out of just Mean Girls. Um, I think it'd be fine to be known for that role, but I also can see how it would have pigeonholed her and look at, I mean, I know Lindsay had other problems too, but like it was a real struggle in terms of just choices for her. Even, even for a while, she was still getting work and it, you know, it was, she, she just wasn't getting the notebook, you know? Yeah. Good question. Thank you. We do, we do have a question online. Great. Um, Amanda asks, so I'm interested in your thoughts about the new remake, especially the fact that it seems to be more centered around Regina. What do you think that says about the character and the reception of the original? I think that's that's such a good point. I mean, it's when you think about Mean Girls in the end, don't you think about Regina? It's like that's the iconic character. You don't you don't ever say to somebody like, oh God, you're so Katie Heron. Like, great name, great character, great actress. But like, and she carried the movie to be sure. But I, you know, when you think of this thing, you th you think of Regina. And so I think that that's what's happened over time is like Regina, you know, Mean Girls equals Regina. You also have the, I mean, a, in a weird way, a similar problem, or I don't know if it's a problem, but you've got Renee Rapp playing Regina in this new one. And R Renee Rapp's just a monster, which I mean in a good way. Um, she is just like eating that up. Like she just, she's just at, that magical moment in her career where she's just, I saw her first on Sex Lives of College Girls and I was like, who is that? <laughs> oh my God. Like she's just so charismatic. And the energy is so different in That's a right. musical and when you're trying to fill up, it's a different space to try to fill. That's right. And also just, you just made me realize the other super key point here. Um, she played the role on Broadway and she is an incredible singer and on Fortunately, the person they cast as Katie is not as trained a singer. So when you've got big musical numbers and you've got Renee Rapp 
and you've got Regina's iconicness coming through. I think that just was necessarily going to happen. Um, it's it's just kind of the way it is, and maybe that's fine. A little little something different. Yeah, something new for a, a new generation. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions? If not, I think we're going to say thank you to Jennifer for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here. And if you do not yet have a copy of the book, um, you can get one on your way out in the back through um, by Seminary Co-op by their table. Jennifer will be signing around the front, so please go out that way and come around to your left and get your book signed. Thank, Thank you. you all. <laughs>